Hi, welcome. My name is Bill Johnson and I'm a PhD student at the University of Western Australia. This is a presentation on predicting athlete ground reaction force and moments from motion capture. If we could understand ground reaction forces and moments on field, we'd be taking a big step to understanding injury risk in situations like this, and this, and it might actually look something like this with a resultant force vector overlaid on the, the image, for example. Because what we'd really like to avoid is this and this, which up to now just hasn't been possible, which means in game athletes can be ignorant to increases in risk of particular injuries. Ground reaction forces and moments are key inputs to calculate downstream muscle forces and joint moments. So if you like, GRFs and GRMs are the front end surrogate indicators of injury risk. If we could understand on-field ground reaction forces and moments, we'd be on the way then to monitoring the real-time risk of injury. So if we can't measure ground reaction forces moments on the field today, how do we measure them? Well, the usual method is with a force plate or platform in a lab like this one. And here, the force plate has been artificially highlighted blue so we can see it. A typical force plate is a 1.2 square meter platform with piezo-resistive or piezoelectric sensors in each corner. And so your bathroom scales measure vertical force. Your lab force plate measures forces and moments in three planes so it can measure movement across it. Force plates are quite difficult to install successfully. The ones that are are, uh, are usually buried into the concrete pad uh, level with the ground during building construction. And a variety of methods are used to minimize external vibrations. There have been a number of attempts to make accurate portable or outdoor devices, but so far these haven't been very successful. They're either cumbersome like this, this shoe or uh, to be honest, irrelevant to the athlete, like the Wii balance board. They, they're usually measuring points of contact or pressure distribution rather than ground reaction forces and moments. Which makes this from Etienne Jules Murray in 1872 even more remarkable. His invention was measuring foot contact via air pressure and rubber tubing connected to a cylindrical recorder. Some more recent studies have attempted to use regression statistics, even neural networks, to try and bridge this gap. But they, so far they tend to be constrained by simple movements such as walking and a small number of trials. Obviously today wearable devices are prevalent, but what's often overlooked is that the devices are making large assumptions from what is one-dimensional low resolution or low fidelity data. In other words, they're making big claims about things that they're not actually measuring, often treating the body as a single unit of mass. Which all means the sports biomechanist is forced to make a trade. Either work outside on field and sacrifice valuable analysis and accuracy, or work in a controlled environment, usually indoors, and lose what we call ecological validity. Uh, in other words, we know the athlete performs differently under artificial conditions. This relevance versus accuracy is one of the biggest criticisms of the sports biomechanist. Sometimes, to be honest, we get close, like this soccer example. Other times, you could argue, not so much. Uh, for example, because of the large number of markers, or for uh, kicking a ball indoors surrounded by expensive equipment. Thankfully, in 1687, Newton defined the relationship for us between a body's mass, acceleration, and force. This is the first edition of Principia Mathematica from the Wren Library at the University of Cambridge with Newton's own annotations. So then our question becomes, are we representing force, mass and acceleration completely enough for Newton's second law to apply? If we are, then surely we can derive force from just mass and acceleration. So let's start by considering how we represent force. And, and initially, let's include uh, ground reaction moments here as well. So force platforms measure the forces and moments applied to their top surface as you move over them. We get three orthogonal force and three moment components as your foot is in contact with the plate. Here we're seeing the three force components, mediolateral side to side, anteroposterior forward and backwards, and vertical. 
for the moments, MX, MY, and MZ, these are the three rotation moments around the corresponding force axes. Ground reaction moments are the twisting effect about the center of mass. Moments are sometimes called moment of force or torque, and sometimes referred to in relation to the moment arm. Uh, this comes from Archimedes, uh, tell me where to stand and I will move the earth. So if you, that's, that's force and moments, uh, and let's, let's just say that mass is pretty straightforward. So then how are we representing A, acceleration? Well, with marker-based motion capture, because if you think about it, marker trajectories contain, inherently contain acceleration information. Retroreflective passive marker-based motion capture is considered to be the gold standard, and at UWA we use a full-body marker set of 67 markers. Now, our aim in this study was instead of using all 67 uh, to try and pick those which related most to force. And we started out with the, uh, these eight anatomically relevant markers shown. So three on each foot, uh, the big toe, the outside of the ankle and the heel, and sacrum and C7. There's another reason we selected these eight, and it's a historical one. The, at UWA, the School of Sports Science, Exercise and Health was one of the first to establish a human movement degree in the Southern Hemisphere, which means that it houses one of the largest sports-related marker-based data repositories in the world. And the main reason then for selecting eight anatomically-based markers is to try and maximize intertester reliability and repeatability, basically that the markers were put in the same place over that time period. So we have F, M, and A now. How then to build the relationship between them? Well, partially squares stands out as a good fit for this kind of data. PLS is a class of supervised multivariate regression, which projects data to a lower dimensional space with the aim of maximizing the covariance between the predictor, in our case, marker trajectories, and the uh, response, the ground reaction forces and moments. PLS is usually more accurate than, for example, principal component regression, which doesn't take into account the response features. And we also consider the sparse nature of marker trajectory data as opposed to raw video might suit sparse PLS methods. Which leads us to our hypothesis. Can we use a trained PLS model to predict ground reaction forces and moments simply from marker-based motion capture? We saw earlier the prevalence of knee injuries. That infographic was from the 2014 NFL season. Because of the attention paid to the causes of knee, particularly ACL injury, change of direction or sidestep movements were a strong research theme. And that's, that's because most ACL injuries occur during a non-contact sidestep or single leg landing. Therefore, this study focused on the sidestep left, where the right foot is planted on the force plate. And what we were able to see from our historical archive was a high potential subset of just over 20,000 motion capture files. And this is where it's a little bit different to perhaps traditional, a traditional investigation in sports science. So rather than being able to control the, uh, the investigation, the data capture, the processing, um, we have to control, or our methods of control, uh, to apply a whole range of quality assurance checks to this archive data. And this includes automatic determination of the foot strike and order classification of the movement type. And what we got was 441 sidestep left trials that successfully passed all our tests. Let's have a quick recap of the study methods. We take the UWA motion capture archive. We identify a high potential subset of data. We apply a bunch of quality assurance checks, we select a movement pattern and we get 441 examples that pass. Three PLS packages were used in this study, the Commercial Eigenvector Research EVRI and two R packages, two open source R packages, regular PLS and sparse PLS, giving a total of 11 PLS methods in play. Now the primary tuning parameter for PLS is the number of internal components and a number of tactics were used across a range of internal components in order to nominate the best for each PLS method. Then in order to rank these PLS methods, the data set was randomly shuffled and split 80-20 into uh, 10 training sets and 10 test sets. 
So at each stage, if you like, we take our trained PLS method and feed it a test uh, motion trajectory. And we're looking for its predicted GRS and GRMs. Uh, across all of the six forces and moments vectors, we're taking the mean correlation coefficient calculated by, which is calculated by comparing this grand truth force plate data with that predicted by the PLS method. So let's look at the results. Now to plot these PLS methods, we averaged the means for the three force and the three moments components. So the three force, uh, the average of the, the three force components is in the vertical axis and for the moments is in the horizontal. And we see that the packages cluster quite nicely. So the, the EVRI in red, the uh, regular RPLS in green, three of them completely overlapping, and the sparse PLS in R in blue, two of them overlapping. And we see that the leading method was the sparse simple PLS indicated by the star. Now, although other methods had greater moments, we, we kind of favored force and also the the sparse simple PLS are the best results for three of the six components individually. Now this graph also shows a comparison against the maximum results reported by our nearest competitor, Oetal, in 2013. But that, of course, illustrates a problem with the graph because we're reporting means, they reported maximums. So if we select our maximum for the best average forces, best average GRF components, and we change the axes so that we can see it, there it appears. So there is, this does also illustrate that there's noise in the moments data with some very good results like this one and others not so good and that's, that explains the wider range between the mean and the max. Another way of uh, looking at the same sample of course is to look at the six forces and moments components individually. And it does illustrate, to be honest, these results are, are much better than we expected. Looking at the bottom left, the FZ uh, vertical force component, this had the greatest correlation because of the influence of mass in the vertical axis against gravity and the greater variance, therefore, for PLS to lock onto. Now, the other thing that sparse PLS gives us is it informs us of the input features that it favors. And what that does is it gives us the relative influence of each of the eight markers over the time base on, on predicting force. So if we take our initial uh, image here, where all the eight markers are the same size, but we change their size according to their relative influence, and we see this. So obviously the right foot markers are important, but also with the medilateral uh, uh, effect on the sidestep being important, we see that C7 uh, being at the end of the moment arm is also considered highly. Let's return to the hypothesis, and of course we see it's proved. Our results clearly demonstrate prediction of ground reaction forces and moments from motion capture trajectories, and also that sparse PLS methods perform the best, in particular sparse simple PLS. So what does this mean for the sports biomechanist? It means that we're closer to predicting ground reaction forces and moments away from the lab. What does this mean for the athlete and coach? It means there's potential for real-time feedback of on-field injury risk. So thank you to my supervisors. Thank you to EVRI for the demo license of PLS Toolbox and everyone who contributed to the, contributed to the original data capture. My name is Bill Johnson. Thank you for your attention.